Good morning, good morning, folks. Uh, so this is Hakim from uh, TAI. Some time back, I was actually asked to, uh, if we are interested to give a talk in the Linux Foundation, in the Open Source uh, Summit. So my answer at the time was actually, uh, maybe not, you know? So you have people who are mostly interested in software, and we are doing something different, that is the AI. So uh, at the same time, we have opened, I'm coming from the team that actually released the Falcon LLM, and we opened it as open source. So we had a lot of discussions around what to do with this open source, what does it mean, the open source in AI, so on and so forth. So a couple of weeks back, I went, I went back to the, to the team that is organizing everything, and I told them, guys, maybe it makes sense that we go and talk to these, to these people. And since day one, actually, I was surprised with the number of talks that actually include AI in the open source summit in North America. So uh, I came with the, an objective of trying to convince people to get involved in the open AI uh, sort of world. But I found, I think, that objective is already achieved. So I will not be doing much of that. So I will just uh, give a quick presentation of how do we see it and probably motivate more people to get into the uh, into this world of open AI, uh, or open source AI. Uh, so I'm coming from TAI. TAI is, research, is an applied research institute that is uh, based in Abu Dhabi in the Emirates, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, TAI is hosting 10 research centers uh, handling different technologies. We are in uh, the AI and digital research, digital, digital science uh, research center. And we are working on the part that is on the LLMs and Falcon, trying to uh, contribute to this world. One of the patterns that are interesting to mention when it comes to the uh, generative AI is the speed of adoption. So I like to see this graphic that shows actually the amount of time that, they, that took for different technologies to reach the one million users. So previously, some years back, when you reach one million user, it was a good indicator even for investors, actually, to put some money on those, on those companies. So if we see Netflix, for example, it took them three years and a half to reach one million users. Uh, if we see Twitter, it took them two years to, to reach one million. If we see ChatGPT, it did that in five, only five days. And we can go mo mo move on even more to see more, more, more uh, impressive statistics. So this actually shows the interest of the technology, but actually, the, uh, the will of users to consume this technology and the interest that, is, that it brings to them uh, eventually. <clears throat> so what was the recipe behind this, the success of this, uh, let's say, generative AI? So we have three things. So the first one is the, the big data. So we see more and more data that is generated. So that is shared on the internet, on the networks. So many people have started, the machine learning community actually started working on this data, but we had issues at some point to handle this large amount on, of data and what we could extract out of that. The second one is the algorithmic part. So more and more, especially with the introduction of the deep neural networks, we started actually finding more interesting ways of analyzing the data and getting something of interest. But these were not enough. So we were actually struggling with algorithms and with data for some time. The third ingredient that allowed the generative AI to get sort of, to get more interest and more visibility was the compute. So the compute, especially with the GPUs, for example, became more available. Companies could use that, institutes could use that. And then the combination of these three, uh, three ingredients, I would say, allowed the building and the, uh, the, the, the spread of this generative AI. We can see that in the figure. So in the past, as I said, around the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, so the research papers that we were seeing were able actually to, to handle few gigabytes of data. Up when we talk about terabytes, we all get impressed and things become much more interesting. In the last few years, we don't talk about only uh, sort of terabytes, we talk about zettabytes, we talk about huge clusters of compute. This is what allowed us to, to do that. So we got the uh, generative AI that came and became more interesting, more popular. We see it mainly from the model perspective, but we have more actors and more stakeholders uh, involved in that. So we have issues like 
people who are providing data, and the data became extremely uh, sensitive uh, these days. So we use public data mostly, but then we have many people who are uh, sort of uh, getting uh, issues with, with the use of that data. Then we have the hardware providers, uh, people, we have a lot of hyperscalers, for example, uh, that are there. And then uh, we have the scientists who actually started taking further things, uh, taking care of improving the models, improving the, the algorithms. We have the developers who are building on top of that, and this is an uh, important source of inputs, actually, for, uh, for, for the researchers. Uh, then we have the businesses who actually try to find some interesting value or add an added value in the, uh, within, within the circle of uh, generative AI. And we have the government, so all the governments are trying, actually, to understand what to do with this AI, how can we uh, sort of uh, put the legislation that will make sure that everybody is safe and everybody is secure. And the last one is the end user. Uh, these are the people who are consuming uh, the, 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 the AI and they actually uh, give value or give feedback uh, to that. From this circle, actually, we can see that there are a lot of uh, different interests, uh, different requirements, different constraints, right? So we moved from uh, an, an era where the AI was about to be centralized uh, between the hands of few actors to some, everybody became actually aware and awake that having that protocol or that way of doing things may be complicated. Leaving your data in a given cloud without knowing what will be done with it will be complicated. So this is where the open source AI came in place and people tried actually to search or started searching into how we can uh, make the, this AI actually more open, more transparent, so on and so forth. So I will just quickly here on the uh, comparison between the open, a the open source AI and the open software. We are actually at the end of the day trying to reach to the same objective. The open software, the idea is that we put the source code uh, at the disposal of the user. They can modify, they can use, they can distribute as they want. It is a, 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 the same thing. It's very similar to what we are trying to achieve uh, in the open AI. This is to say that the open source AI is not something new at the end of the day. So we will be using and learning a lot from the, the, the community. But one of the interesting things is maybe to do a sort of a, a quick review of what is really open in the open source AI, right? So I just put here uh, quickly the, uh, the different steps, the main steps uh, to build the model. So you go from the data, you clean your data, you have uh, code and processes to execute, you get your clean data, you put it in your code base to build your model, you have your model, you do some evaluation, and then you do some fine tuning to get, to get your uh, final model. So the only thing we see today that is really open is the model. So you get the weights of the model, but you don't get anything else, right? So that is extremely problematic, and it doesn't allow, actually, anyone to look further in the model. What data was used to train the model? How, what did you do to uh, clean the data? How do you do your evaluation? All these things are still question marks for everyone, and we need to work on more on that. This is just to show the interest of the open source uh, AI. So it's a comparison between the closed source, I would say, and the open source. The nice thing is that, one, we are catching up. So the performance and the interest of the open source AI is getting better more and more. The second thing, I believe, is that we cannot have a straightforward comparison between the closed source and the open source. We don't know what is behind those APIs that are exposed from the closed source, but we believe that it's more than just a model, more than just an LLM, so it's complicated to compare that, but there is a huge hope we are getting, we are catching up in terms of uh, performance. This is just a comparison with for the upsides and downsides of the open source AI and the uh, closed source AI. You can, I'm sure everybody in the room will recognize that these are exactly the same uh, upsides and downsides for the open source software and the closed source uh, software. One of the messages that I wanted to, to share today is that the open source AI is really at, the, at its infancy. So we still need to learn a lot, and I think the community that will bring this value is the open source software, and that's why we are here today. I like this figure, uh, actually, where I wanted just to show that we have a lot of initiatives in the open source AI world. 
And I think, compared to the uh, Linux Foundation, for example, we are actually starting from the end, where we have plenty of uh, initiatives, but we do not have coordination uh, a lot around this. In terms of challenges, so we have a lot of challenges for the open source community. Previously, in the uh, open source software community, we were saying that having a laptop and an internet connection can help you to open a startup. We believe that it's not the case anymore in the AI world. We need more than a laptop. One of the challenges is the compute. We need a lot of compute to work with these models, to improve the models, to fine tune the models, and it, it's pretty complicated. This goes with the budget. We have a lot of politics involved in the uh, open AI, and this is all around the world. I think there is a need to uh, work a little bit on letting researchers and developers uh, improve what they are doing, uh, explore research more. Uh, after that, we can do the politics. There is the IP issue, and we have a lot to learn from the Linux Foundation and from the open source software uh, community. So what the open source community can, can do for us, I think uh, we can leverage the multi-decade experience. A lot of lessons have been learned, and I think it's important to get these communities to work together. We still don't know how to build a community, as I said before. We're having a lot of uh, initiatives, but we don't know how to get uh, together. And then we have issues with the standardization. Everybody is working alone. It would be nice to get this experience uh, quickly. Uh, just quickly, in, within this context, we have created the Falcon Foundation. Uh, that is aiming actually to bring researchers together to try to make, like to contribute to the Falcon, but actually to contribute overall to the uh, open LLM or open AI, open source AI uh, world. The foundation has been created a couple of months back and has a funding of 300 million. Uh, we support a lot the compute part because we believe that is the blocking point for most of, of the researchers. Just to conclude, so we have uh, high potential in the open source uh, AI world. There are a lot of things to be done, uh, but we need to do more. We need to do more in terms of coordinations, in terms of IP, in terms of funding. We have a lot of uh, challenges. TII is supporting through the uh, Falcon Foundation, and we are happy to, uh, to get in touch with uh, everyone. And I believe, I'm confident that if the open source software community is involved, we will get, we'll do things much further and we'll do things much better. Thank you.